Hi everyone, this is uh, an introductory video to the play A Doll's House by Henrik Ibsen. Uh, today we're going to look at Act 1 and start pulling apart some of the dramatic devices that are apparent within the play. At the opening of the play, and it's focused specifically on the introductory information that's provided, um, it's important to reiterate that as a play we need to acknowledge that this is would have an audience and that there is a set uh, need to be incorporated in your analysis of the play as you are working. Looking at the start, it says a comfortable room furnished inexpensively but with taste. In the back wall there are two doors out to a hall, the other to the left leads to Helmer's study. It's a piano. In the middle of the left hand wall is a door with a window on its nearer side round table with armchairs and a small sofa. Right hand side, rather to the back is a door and farther forward on this wall there is a tiled stove with a couple of easy chairs and a rocking chair in front of it. The door and the stove stands a little table. There are etchings on the wall and there is a cabinet with china ornaments and other bric-a-brac case with handsomely bound books. There is a carpet on the floor and the stove is lit. It is a winter's day. Just looking specifically at this introductory material that sets the scene for us, we can already start to establish a connection between how the stage has been laid out, like, and uh, the type of concerns that Ibsen is tapping into from his time period. To begin with, the fact that locked in a room uh, where there's nowhere else to go, reinforces some of the claustrophobia that or throughout the play with regards to Nora and then in more general terms, women of the time, married women of the time, um, and the restricted nature of their lives. We, as an audience, are trapped in that room. We cannot go anywhere else. The stage does not alter in terms of its setting. We are there for the entirety of the play mind it helps the audience experience uh, the trapped nature of Nora it helps them experience some of the things like the restriction Nora has with regards to uh, Helmer's workspace a discussion at the time about the separate spheres of men and women particularly with regards to home life versus work Helmer's study one of the doors to the left um, is a place that we as an audience member cannot access we cannot go in there we can't and so right from the word go, you're starting to experience some of this claustrophobia that uh, Nora herself is experiencing. If we look at some of the material that's uh, laid out on the setting, uh, things like the etchings that are on the wall or the bric-a-brac, the little china ornaments, the handsomely bound book, the carpet on the floor, chairs, directly to the idea yeah, that's uh, at the top of the page about the room being furnished inexpensively but with taste. So it's establishing the class for us, it's establishing that they are uh, an upper middle class family, the bourgeoisie, that they are trying to work towards uh, mimicking uh, as best as they can this idea of uh, growing affluence within society. So the setting also reinforces that cultural aspect for us. As we keep going down, we actually then get the introduction to Nora herself. So more stage directions here. Uh, a bell rings in the hall outside and a moment later the door is heard to open. Nora comes into the room humming happily. She is in outdoor clothes and is carrying an armful of parcels which she puts down on the table to the right. Through the hall door, which she has left open, can be seen a porter. He is holding a Christmas tree and a hamper and he gives them to the maid who has opened the front door. And with these stage directions, we can um, establish the fact that has been outlined at the top, um, that Nora does actually, I think that's often a misconception that she's you know, trapped there. She can leave. Um, the relationship, she is very much confined. You get to encounter some of the uh, um, uh, lower class who are involved in the world of this play, so people like the porter and the maid. But 
Um, we don't really see very much of these characters. We definitely don't hear very much about them. They're sort of there in the background. And that is one of the criticisms of this play, that it's so focused intently on uh, the upper middle class that everyone else is forsaken. And definitely, if you're approaching this from a Marxist perspective, that is something that you can consider. The Christmas tree and the hamper obviously give us uh, a rough time period for the setting of this play. Um, and they set the mood, if you like, for this act. Most definitely, it is supposed to be a joyful time. It's a time for celebration. It's a time for family. So this is all established for us before we even hear any spoken dialogue. Uh, and again, I re re reiterate the need to uh, acknowledge the stage directions as much as possible and continually remind yourself that you are writing about a play, something which is performed live. I just want to speak. So we introduced to her. Uh, a semblance straight away of her character through the dialogue that she so through the language um, incorporated in the stage directions so reading through and uh, we'll, we'll get a little bit of a taste for her character and Helmer's character as they approach hide the Christmas tree properly Helena the children mustn't see it till this evening decorated Taking out her purse, she asks, how much is that? There's a corona. No, keep the change. So even things like that indicate that, uh, you know, these people, Nora and her husband, are living comfortably. They're able to tip in that, in that sense. Goes, Nora shuts the door and takes off her outdoor clothes, laughing quietly and happily to herself. Taking a bag of macaroons from her pocket, she eats one or two, then goes cautiously. She starts humming again, and she goes over to the table on the right. These stage directions that we continue to see here are, again, really, really important. Uh, this idea of taking a bag of macaroons from a quickly understand that this is, you know, a forbidden treat that Helma doesn't approve of her eating um, these sort of sweets. Um, is uh, disapproved of is you know reinforced by the word you know then she, she goes cautiously to her husband's door, be asking questions as to why is she having to tiptoe around in her own home, and it does it reinforces that power balance or that power and difference that we see between the husbands and the wives in this particular social group at this time. But from his study, so we don't actually see him yet calls out, is that my Skylark twittering out there? Or responds, you know, it is. Scampering about like a little squirrel? Yes. When did the squirrel get home? Just this minute. Bag of macaroons in her pocket, wipes in her mouth, and you can see what I've bought. Exclaims, I'm busy. But then a moment later, he opens the door and he looks out, pen in hand. What? All that has my little feather brain been out wasting money again. Dialogue is so laden with um, terms that you can use to analyze the relationship between the two of them. Mama says, Is that my little skylark? And then later, scampering about like a little squirrel. We've got two different things happening from a language perspective. The squirrel. Uh, on, a, on a surface level are essentially terms of affection, in terms of endearment, the, the, the types of terms that you would see people using even today. The fact that he uses the diminutive adjective beforehand, though, little, um, reinforces that power balance between the two. And the way that he treats her, there is a, quite a, an explicit infantilization that is happening here from Helma of Nora. continues to use that tone through much of the first act and definitely some of the second act but definitely in act one you see that uh, language and that power balance really established already of the act you also note that his interest in her what about when he understands that she has bought something that she's spent money so you get another one of his major concerns coming to the surface immediately before we've even seen him 
Okay, this idea of my little feather brain has been out wasting money again, consuming. He is, in effect, censuring her. And again, we get this infantilization that comes from the husband to the wife as if he's talking to his child, not someone who's supposed to be his equal in the relationship. That is not the power dynamic that is established here. It's definitely one of superiority on his part. Nora says, but Torvald, surely this year we can let ourselves go just a little bit. It's the first Christmas that we haven't had to economize. Mustn't waste money, you know. Oh, Torvald, surely we can waste a little now, just the teeniest bit. Now that you are going to earn a big salary, you'll have lots and lots of money. The language that she uses is interesting because, uh, you know, a lot of commentary talks about how she's in fact a, a very manipulative wife, um, that she plays her husband in effect. Um, it, it's a, certainly a, a justifiable interpretation. Uh, when you see lines like this, where she is uh, embodying that infantilization that is put upon her by society and speaking almost like a child, you know, the teeniest bits, you'll have lots and lots of money. You begin to question, is she, uh, uh, has she been molded in this way and so just behaving as she has been taught or is she trying to manipulate him by, you know, playing to the, the stereotype, the infantilized woman, the infantilized wife in a relationship? He responds, after New Year's Day, yes, but there'll be a whole quarter before I get paid. Borrowed till then. Nora, he goes to her and takes her playfully by the ear. And this is where you see those stage directions really reinforcing that infantilization in many ways more than the dialogue itself. So please don't ignore those incidences of stage direction. They are so important in governing um, or giving you a, a real clear sense uh, and evidence to back up your arguments with regards to this power dynamic in the relationship. See this language, the same little scatterbrain. brain. Just suppose I borrowed a thousand kronos a day and you went and spent it all by Christmas and then on New Year's Eve, I a tile fell on my head and there I lay. Putting a hand over his mouth, she says, shh, don't say such horrid things, but suppose something of the sort were to happen hard as that were to happen, I don't expect I should care whether I owed money or not. But what about the people I borrowed from? Them? Who bothers about them? They're just strangers. Nora. Just like a woman. You know what I think about that sort of thing. No debts, no borrowing. There's something constrained, something ugly even, about a home that's founded on borrowing and debt. You and I have managed to keep clear up till now, and we shall do so for the little time that is left. That bit of dialogue from Helmer is obviously so important. For starters, we get, uh, again, further censuring, you know, this Nora Nora with the exclamation marks, just like a woman. There is a gendered assumption here with these exclamations that women know nothing about finance, know nothing about um, and, you know, certainly uh, explained with the way that she quite flippantly says, well, I wouldn't care about the money I owed. But it is reinforcing that stereotype at the time. It is this um, belief uh, on Helmer's part with regards to debt. Pushing for us, his mindset and his stance on the issue of money and debt. Right at the start of the play from a dramatic perspective, because we need to understand why he acts the way he does all the way later in act three, when he discovers the debt deceit. Uh, all of these things are established for us right now here in this opening scene. Nora goes over to the stove and she says, very well told, if you say so, in her behavior. He says, now, now, my little songbird mustn't be so crestfallen. Well, is the squirrel sulking and taking out his wallet? Guess what I have here? She turns quickly and she exclaims, money. Okay. He hands her some notes. Good heavens, I know what a lot has, uh, I know what a lot has to go on housekeeping at Christmas time. And she's there counting in the meantime, going 10, 20, 30, 40. Oh, thank you, Torvald. Thank you. This will keep me going for a long time. 
well, you must see that it does. That particular scene, to the power dynamics in that relationship. Nora, as a woman of that time, as a wife, is entirely dependent upon her husband. There is no financial independence whatsoever in this relationship. Reading, particularly the, the modern feminist readings of this, is obviously, uh, obviously highly critical. You're looking at a, a dynamic where women are essentially powerless and by their husbands. And in a sense, if you think back to the title of the play, this idea of a doll's house and the confinement, all of these different elements come together to reinforce what is going on here. And what Ibsen ultimately does later on when he has Nora walking out, breaking all of these different uh, of subordination that she has to suffer when she leaves Helma. Deal culturally at the time. It explains the controversy. Nora says, Oh, yes, of course I will. But now come and see all the things. Things I've bought so cheaply too. Look, here's a new suit for Eva and a sword too. Here's a horse and a trumpet for Bob, and here's a doll and a doll's bed for Emmy. Which will soon smash them to bits anyway. And these are dress lengths and handkerchiefs for the maids. Old Nanny really ought to have something more. We see that she's a conservative spender. We obviously understand later on that that conservative spending is so that way she could uh, put away some of the money and you know, recoup the debt. What we also see here right at the bottom, again, passing comments made an old nanny. There's no real acknowledgement happening. Helma asks, and what's in that parcel? And Nora squeals. Again, you get this behavior from her character that actually reinforces the childlike nature that has been imposed upon her. It's really interesting how she behaves in this first act. We aren't really sure whether she's or acting. Um, hard to see. She says, no, Torvald, you're not to see that till this evening. And now, little prodigal, what do you think? Oh me, I don't want anything at all. Ah, uh, but you must now tell me anything within reason that you feel you'd like. She says, no, you see the ellipses there. I really can't think of anything unless another ellipses, Torvald, another ellipses. Instances are her hesitating. Again, it's really unsure whether she is being or genuinely fearful of asking the next question that she is going to ask of him really tell at this point in the play it is interesting to watch her do it um, and obviously the dialogue and the stage directions reinforce this for whoever is acting he asks well and Nora not looking at him playing with his waistcoat buttons instead to give me something you could well you could come along out with it you could give me money Torvald, only what you think you could spare, and then one of these days I'll buy something with it. Oh, do, Torvald, please, please do. Then I'll wrap it in pretty gold paper and hang it on the Christmas tree. What do they call little birds who are always making money fly? Yes, I know, ducks and drakes. But let's do what I said, Torvald, and then I'll have time to think of something that I really want. Very sensible, isn't it? Helma smiles and says, oh, very. That is, it would be if you really kept the money I give you and actually bought something for yourself with it. But if it goes in with the housekeeping and gets spent on all sorts of useless things, then I only have to pay out again. Well, you can't deny it, little Nora, now can you? The waste. He says, it's a sweet little bird, but it gets through a terrible amount of money. It costs a man when he's got a little songbird like you. Last comment, again, reinforces the diminutive adjectives that he's using with his wife. But interestingly, he switches to the third person down the bottom of 150, um, using that 
impersonal pronoun, it's a sweet little bird, but it gets through a terrible amount of money. He is again being quite censuring. And interestingly, complaining about, you know, how much it costs a man when he's got a little songbird like you, like she's a burden, like she's an expense rather than his wife. And that's reiterated also a little bit earlier when he says, uh, then I only have to pay out again. Relationship. One to consider from the gendered and the Marxist perspective, you know, is Nora being manipulative? Is he just grossly naive? Do they actually know what's going on and are just play acting for the sake of retaining the marriage because that was the social expectation at the time? Got to ascertain really what's going on within these first couple of pages, but it is such thing and it's so rich with material that you can use. Looking at this, remember to consider the stage directions, to consider the dialogue, to consider how they're behaving and weave all of these elements into the way that you discuss things like gendered criticism or Marxist criticism.